If we can use all the light we can get tonight, amen. Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5. In your Bibles, we continue kind of with a, uh, we continue preaching through the book of Galatians and looking at it just in context. It's great stuff. We, uh, we are in Galatians chapter 5, specifically looking at the Holy Spirit, your companion in life's sin struggle. The Holy Spirit, your companion in life's sin struggle. And this is part two, all right? We already saw those incredible words, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I believe the verses that we are looking at and the subject we're looking at in Galatians is one of the, if not the most, important discussions in the Bible about your Christian living, all right? There is real instruction here. There is real direction here about a successful Christian life. It is absolutely necessary to get the grounding and the understanding of walking in the Holy Spirit within you in order to understand uh, both the negative side of saying no to the works of, the, of your flesh and the temptations of your flesh, but then, yes, to the positive side of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So both of these things are found in this passage. And before we return to Galatians chapter 5, I think it would be good, very good for you to know that there is a sister passage. Uh, there is a, for those of you who hunger and thirst after righteousness, that you would be filled, as, as Jesus said, there is somewhere else for you to go, either tonight when you go home or tomorrow. Make it your devotion time. And it is Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1 through 14. And I want to tell you, it is just like bookends to this, this passage. It is just like a, mirror, a mirrored image. It has more perspective on this. In fact, we might go back and preach that passage while we're preaching Galatians chapter 5 because it is such a close twin sister of this passage. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll read the word. Father, thank you for this hour. I pray that you would use it for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Galatians 5, would you stand, please, for the reading of God's word. Galatians 5, beginning in verse number 16. Galatians 5, and verse number 16. So scan with your eyeballs verse 1 through 15. And really remember where we came from in this argument about, you know, flesh not being possible to, to cause you to inherit eternal life. That Christ stand fast in the liberty of Christ and he is the only thing. And then it comes to verse number 16. Then I, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Look up here a moment. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Galatians, the original reformer, not Martin, Martin Luther King, you know, Martin Luther, the old guy, uh, he believed in this passage that the word spirit was talking about human spirit. I don't think that's true. I wanted to throw that out there to you uh, so that you might see a commentary that might refer. But as we work down through this, the whole thing is that the power has to come from the Lord. It is talking about the Holy Spirit, okay? Not the human spirit. Sorry, Martin Luther got a whole lot of things right. I don't think he got that right. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you believe that is true, if you've experienced that, say amen. Amen. You cannot do the things that you would struggle. But if you be led of the Spirit, this is the verse we start with tonight. If you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And we'll talk about what that means. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that means all kinds of evil, idolatry, okay, not idolatry, now it's idol, idols, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, and drunkenness, revelings, that's all kind of, that's partying, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do, okay, rightly understood the do here is willfully practice, like you see in 1 John 3, they that willfully practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's serious. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. You may be seated. The great command and wonderful opportunity in verse number 16 is walk in the Spirit. We've already talked about this. Walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk with the Holy Spirit. We saw the struggle within each of us of flesh against the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, this tug of war that goes on in our life every day. We already preached up to verse number 18, so we begin there. And point number one tonight in the passage, you can pro- live a progressive life progressive not perfect you can live a progressive godly christian life by walking by the holy spirit right there is light here there is joy here Uh, there's a a pastor great pastor his name is kevin de young and he has a, a message that talks about the frustration that believers get into when they are fighting their flesh And DeYoung talks about that, you know, he just kind of opens the sermon with saying that some Christians just view this as an impossible, an impossibility of success. Well, the, 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 the perfectionism is impossible, all right? But, you know, this passage begins to shed light on the understanding that it is possible to die to your flesh it is, po- it is possible to yield to the Holy Spirit that is in you, and there is the possibility of a progressively successful Christian life. And by successful, I mean following God, obeying God, denying your flesh. Look at that little phrase, phrase in verse number 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, what is that talking about? Look at, look at where it's connected, the, the phrase before it. You cannot do the things that we, you would. Everyone said, yay. You know, when I said that, do you, you connect with that? Yes, I know that struggle. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. I want to start by explaining this a little bit, that back in verse number 16, there were fragrances of success over your flesh. There was little spots and smells of success. It said, walk in the Spirit, and then this little phrase, ye shall not fulfill. That's success. All right, there is that promise there. There is that view of the believer that I actually can, uh, I can, comma, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That is a possibility by walking in the Spirit. It's successful language. The truth is that we feel the failures of sin so strongly oftentimes that we become consumed with those feelings of failure as, as conscientious Christians. We, we, we often become overwhelmed by viewing our failures. And this is something that we do not see. We do not see that the vast majority of times we are being led of the Holy Spirit. We are successfully obeying God. I want to tell you, I want to give you permission to realize that in your life and stop staring at the minority failures and not seeing the majority successes of each day walking by the Holy Spirit of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? That there is progressive success as we yield the Holy Spirit of God. And though your failures look so rough to you, and then you, and you, you hang your head and say, how can I ever be saved? Or you hang your head and say, why would God ever save me? Okay, all those crazy thoughts. Understand that the majority of time, believer, you are willingly yielding the Holy Spirit of God and take joy in that. There is joy in that. We will always fight and sometimes fail to the flesh, but our daily lives are mostly characterized by walking the Holy Spirit of obeying God. And I say, praise the Lord. Don't be tempted to give up because you think fighting the flesh is impossible. Don't give up. By the Holy Spirit, there is progressive success. And so look at the phrase then in verse number 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. 
That is, you are yielding to the Holy Spirit's guiding and leading, as we talked about last time, then you're not under the law. What, do you, what does it mean by that? What does the phrase mean? It is right after the phrase, you cannot do the things that you would. And that is speaking of, as, as the whole book of Galatians is talking about, the flesh, it's impossible by discipline, it's impossible by trying hard, it's Im- impossible by your flesh to please God. There is a failure mechanism built into the law in your flesh. Your flesh cannot live up to the law. It's an impossibility. You remember that? That's the whole point of the book of Galatians. You cannot keep the law in the flesh. You cannot be accepted by the Lord by hard work in the flesh. You need Christ. That's why you need Christ. Then it says, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law. And it's talking about that sin struggle of failure. It's talking about the inability of the flesh to keep the law and fail time after time after time. That is the failure system. But there is another system. It is an alien that has come inside of you. It's the third person of God. It's the Holy Spirit. And he can succeed. He is not under the law of failure as your flesh is. He has come to be your companion, to hold your hand, to do what's right. To fight the flesh that's contrary to his desires. To lead you to do right. And what the flesh could never do, and what your personal trying and Toby's trying could never do, the Holy Spirit has the power to lead us to do. To obey God, to become like Jesus, to bear amazing fruit that we're going to see in a moment. And Roman Romans 8, that sister passage, says it this way. Now listen to it, okay? It says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak in the flesh, okay? Could, no success there. Dot, dot, dot. Next verse, the, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit okay so there is this real truth here about the holy spirit of god that's inside of me walking in the spirit can say no to sin the way that flesh never could the way that trying or discipline or trying in your body never could there is a holy spirit that could I think Christians sometimes look at this passage, and I have too, many times, and the Romans 8 passage, and I'm looking, we're looking for some great mysticism in these verses. You know, some, some way to you know, get into the spirit. I'm going to do that until you're so awkwardly uncomfortable. Uh, except that there is just no hint of that here, is there? There's no get in a quiet place and put on low um, Christian music until you are in the spirit. There is no hint of anything like that. It is just a very factual, straightforward, accessible, successful sounding thing. Walk by the spirit. I imagine that this passage is much simpler than some try to make it. It is a simple surrender, a willingness, a striving, a willingness to follow the lead, a dependency of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me from the inside out. An acknowledgement that he is certainly inside of me, and he certainly wants to lead me, and I cannot be successful this day without him, and I will yield to him. I don't believe that it's hard or a confusing thing. I think it's quite a wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit of God has come to live inside of you and me. A daily surrender, a fight by fight, a moment by moment, with an overall determination that I want to walk in the Holy Spirit of God. That is progressive success. Point two here, point two. Those who willingly practice the works of the flesh the sin, shall not inherit eternity with God. Those who willingly practice the works of the flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 19 through 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, and drunkenness, uh, revelings, and such like, 
of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do such things. You hear that pop, pop, pop in the sound system? It's when, when us guys have our, our uh, cell phones near the pa this pack, and it goes pop, pop, pop. I knew that was going to happen. Sorry about that. Do such things. It's very important to understand the grammar here. It's the same grammar as 1 John 3. It's not talking about Christians who struggle and fail. It's exactly talking the exact opposite of that. It is about those who do not struggle, who do, who practice, is a good translation, who practice sin in the flesh, who willfully live in sin in the flesh. Whether that person has some kind of profession of Jesus Christ, of, of salvation or not, is irrelative in the passage. It's not a profession that we're talking about. It's proof. It is proof that the Holy Spirit of God has come to wrestle against the flesh inside of them. And where there is no wrestle, there is no salvation. They willingly do such things, verse 21, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Passages like these, and there are multitudes, not multitudes, there are several. Young people, please listen to me. You need good grounding in salvation. Passages like these are a very hard struggle for pray this prayer and I guarantee you got saved kind of thinking and salvation, which is not correct. Pray this prayer and then go live the rest of your life for the devil. It's okay. You had that experience when you were five and it's going to be all right. This is a passage about proof of whether you're truly born again. Everyone in this room, please see the truth. There are several passages like this in Scripture. They are intentionally awkward for the Lord to get our attention. And, and they basically say this. The direction you are heading in life is proof of where you will end up. I want to say that again. The direction that you are heading in life, whether it's following the Holy Spirit or whether it's following your flesh, is proof of your destination, of where you are going to turn up in eternity. And that's scary. We will go through each sin here in the list in a future message. But tonight I want to impress that a willing practice of living in sin is proof positive that someone does not have the Holy Spirit living within them. There is no struggle. They are willfully sinning. May everyone who hears this message share it with others and the fear of God come upon us all. We are not saved or lost by the quantity of our sin. But willful practicing of sin is the litmus test of someone who is without salvation. That they willfully, day by day, live in the practice of sin. And it's not just here. 1 John 3 thunders this. Thunders this. If you live in the willful practice of sin, you do not know God. We must never give even someone we love so much the assurance of being saved because of some experience of their youth or something they are hold on, holding on to if they are w living in the willful practice of sin. That is proof that they do not have the Lord. Perhaps the Lord would use this in some heart here tonight. That you find yourself living willfully in the practice of sin on a daily basis. I warn you, let there be nothing that gives you assurance but the word of God. Hear these words. The struggle of verse 17 between the Holy Spirit fighting against your flesh to, to, to lead you to do what is right, that is proof of your salvation. The lack of the struggle, struggle when you willfully give in to sin on a daily basis, you're willfully participating in it. That is the litmus test that you don't have the, the Holy Spirit struggling with you against your flesh. It is fearful. And the way that it says is so strong. I, verse 21, look at it. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. I'm repeating what I've told you before. 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They will certainly arrive at the destination of the life that they are living right now. This idea particularly comes up in the verses because the admonition for believers to walk in the Spirit so that they won't fulfill these works of the flesh. And then he throws this very hard thing down. You know, if you willfully live in the works of the flesh, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not saved. It comes, this admonition we find is more than good advice for the Christian. It is a warning about our souls. It is a warning about our souls. And here is the reason that this is just one application that, that is such a danger in modern churches where, where willful sinners find comfort and acceptance because no one judges them, although they're living and willfully in sin. And they think they've got a great church because of it. No, they have a church that's leading them to hell. They have the church that is accommodating. The idea that a believer with the Holy Spirit of God in them can live day after day after day willfully practicing sin. They are accommodating the way to hell. People claiming to follow Jesus who live in fornication and drunkenness and adultery and illicit drugs and pornography and anger and covetousness without struggle, without whatever, Attending churches without judgment, without church discipline, without warning, without confrontation. They think it's a great church because they're never confronted. If you're a professing believer who is yielding to the works of the flesh willfully, I exhort you to consider these verses and immediately destroy your bridges of sin and walk by the Holy Spirit who is leading you to righteousness on a daily basis if you continue to live willfully in your sin, you're going to hell. That's what the scripture says. It's probably the most loving thing I could tell you tonight. <laughs> Number three in the passage. Yielding to the Holy Spirit will grow godly fruit in you. Yielding to the Holy Spirit will grow godly fruit in you. Look at 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay, this, it's, it's toggling back and forth. You can, you, can, you can follow the works of the flesh. You will not go to the kingdom of God. You know, follow instead the fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And he'll produce fruit in you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Yielding to the Holy Spirit will grow godly fruit in you. When the Lord Jesus saved you and the Spirit of God came inside of you, He wants to grow you. It's not just about saying no to the flesh. It's not just about the negative of not sinning. It is the positive here that there is fruit to be had. It is positive here that, that I can become like the Lord Jesus Christ over time, progressively, as this fruit grows in me. It, it, there is the positive here of improving my life, my attitude, my outlook, the way that I treat my wife, the works of uh, uh, the way that I do good works to other people, the joy in my life. Yielding to the Spirit progressively grows fruit in me. And here is a limited list. There are other fruits of the Spirit mentioned in Scripture. Uh, we will go over these next time along with the works of the flesh. But even the difference of how this is said, you know, is telling you this walk in the Spirit, right? Don't fulfill the works of the flesh. Even the words works of the flesh is what your flesh can do. It's how, you know, you are work, you are doing this, and it's sin, it's bad. But the, the term fruit is that as I am led by the Holy Spirit, as I am submitting to the Holy Spirit, He is doing something to me. He's growing something in me that I could never grow in myself. Not all the self-discipline in all the world will grow on you, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, these things. It just won't. The Holy Spirit has to do that. His fruit, it cannot be accomplished by trying or striving or discipline, is, is free. I don't, want, I don't want to say free for the picking. That would be a real bad pun. It's free for the growing in your life as you yield to him. Now listen, some of you are frustrated because this doesn't happen. Boom, instantly. You don't get 100% love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous, whatever, at one time. You know, sanctification doesn't work like that. Christian growth doesn't work like that. It, it's growth. 
Okay, even fruit. Some of you have grown fruit. You know, you know that it takes a long time for things to grow. And so it is with our Christian life. And the Spirit of God is doing this over many, many, many years. He is growing these things in our life. I think it's just encouraging to know that, there, that this can be had by the Holy Spirit. And this is a great secret of your Christian life. And this is what it means to be spiritual. You know, you, you know you've heard it sometimes, you know, be spiritual, and, and you're spiritual if this and this. And usually there's a list of rules. If you don't do this, if you don't have, you know, if you don't, have a TV in your bedroom, or if you don't, uh, you know, uh, dress like a hippie, and if you don't, whatever, this, there's usually, you know, and then you're spiritual if you do this. You're spiritual if you come out. No, this is the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, this is what it means to be spiritual, to have these fruits in your life. Not because you put on all these rules or all these standards in your life. That's not what it is. You know, being like Jesus is this list. Spiritual. Walking each day by the lead of the Holy Spirit. Him giving you the power to say no to the flesh. Dying to it. So that the Holy Spirit can have all of you. This is big. This is a great secret that is revealed. Walking with the person of God who, who's come to live inside of you. Because you received Jesus Christ. Now there are a couple conclusions of this passage at the end of this chapter. So let's read them in 24 through 26. It says... And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. For you Greek scholars, that is an aorist verb, have crucified. It means it's something that happened in definite time in the past, okay? So they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In the third conclusion, 26, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So there's three conclusions here. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its desire. Does that, doesn't that sound contradictory to verse 17 about the struggle? You know, it sounds like, you know, if you're reading through here and you hit this verse, you're like, wait a minute. You know, you just told me I'm going to be struggling about it. And I got to yield to the Spirit so that, you know, that I can win in this thing. And then all of a sudden you're telling me that it's crucified. What, was it, what does it mean? It's talking about the fact that you were there with Jesus on that cross when he really killed the power of your flesh over your life. And understanding that the death blow was given, this is very important to understand this. And there is a, this Bible understanding that the power of the cross, that things were totally accomplished there that day on Calvary, but we don't see the full reality until later. So that, for instance... The devil was totally defeated that day on the cross. Do you believe that? Amen? So, so is the devil still active now? Yes. And so it's this understanding, okay? This theological understanding. Dead, but dying. And I like to think of the devil side of it as like, that, and you can think of your flesh side of it like this too, in this passage. That on that cross, Jesus Christ gave the power of your flesh a humongous head blow. It is a fatal death wound. And the power to, to make you in slavery to sin and to make you do temptation is truly gone. But that flesh is still dying, and you have to fight it until that day that you see Jesus face to face. It is dead in the cross. The power is broken, but it is dying. So this is, this is what verse 24 is saying. Look at it again. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So what the Lord is telling you is that you can say no to your flesh and yield to the Holy Spirit because on the cross, Jesus Christ gave that flesh, your flesh, a death blow. And that is the power to die to your flesh. That is the power to say no to the flesh. It comes from what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And as you fight your Christian fight, you need to understand that Jesus really did kill the power of your flesh. And it's going to, that flesh is going to raise up its head Please know, every time it raises up his head, notice the death gash that is on your flesh's head. Okay, I say that's all metaphoric by saying this. You've got to understand that as strong as your flesh is to tempt you, that it cannot make you, you sin. That Christ has given it the death blow. And you can, every time, yield to the Holy Spirit of God. You can walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's what the Scripture says. Part of 
knowing and part of yielding is, is believing that that death blow has been given to your flesh. It is dead, but dying. Your flesh is living with a death sentence that cannot make you sin. There's a second conclusion here, all right? In verse 25, since we have the Spirit, we need to walk by Him. All right, look what it says. It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And I love this. God is so obvious here, and He's so practical. This verse is like, duh. So it's like, when you were born again, the Holy Spirit made you alive. He made you born again, alive. He came to live inside of you. He's the spirit of life in you. If you live in him, you know every, the Bible says every child of God has the spirit of God. Since you already have him, you had might as well live and walk in him. That's what it's saying. He is there as this great resource. But many believers, have, though having the Holy Spirit, do not yield and walk to with that Holy Spirit on a daily basis. So it's a duh verse. Come on, man. You have it. You have the Spirit. Him. Walk by Him. Conclusion number three. We must not continue to practice sin. All right? Here's the conclusion. I mean, there's a big argument about not yielding the works of the flesh, yielding the Spirit. And then verse 26, 26 says this. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Verse 26 seems really random. Until you remember, look with your eyeballs uh, up at verse 14 and 15 that our, our argument started by the illustration that one of the big works of the flesh is fighting each other. One of the big ways that Christians fail is by biting each other. Sometimes the sheep bite. All right? It ends the same way. The conclusion, let us not, you know, yield to the Holy Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, pride among other Christians, other people, provoking one another, envying one another. We must not continue to practice sin. Here's the example that we started with. It is not acceptable. It is not necessary. It is not God-honoring. It is not regular, whatever. You have the Holy Spirit of God within you. Yield to him and stop biting the other sheep. Stop fighting with other people, even that aren't sheep. Stop it. Yield to the Holy Spirit and his power. Kill the works of your flesh. I end this tonight, this great passage, with saying that you're not alone in the struggle. And it's not a matter of willpower. The quicker that you appeal to the Holy Spirit to help you, the better at your day. The better. The, the more you know you can't do it alone, the better. The better. You have a great companion who has all the power. Not willpower, not discipline, not an emotional invitation decision. That's often the case, you know. Christians, this big, you know, great uh, cry to an invitation time at the end of the sermon, and you're doing all these nasty things, and you ought to feel bad about it. Come here to these steps, and, and we, some of you have been through, through that, whatever. They go back the next day, and they walk in the flesh. <laughs> okay, this is your surrender to the Holy Spirit of God, your companion, to make you successful, to turning away from the flesh and walking by the Holy Spirit. And it is successful because God says it's successful. Believe that companion is within you and yield to him. I was going to say tomorrow morning, but let me rather say tonight. Would you bow?